Hello, everyone. This is Matt Britton, founder and CEO of Suzy. And I'm really happy, I mean, just so happy to be here today uh, with my dear friend, Rachel Tippograph, founder and CEO of Micmac. Rachel, how are you? I'm great, saying hello from Texas in my hotel room. That looks like the Driscoll. Is that where it is? <laughs> I'm, I'm bringing South by Southwest or, back. Or you're in an undisclosed location, which is, if that's the case, that's cool. Yeah, that's exactly. That should have been it. Exactly. Um, well, it's great to see you. And uh, thanks so much for doing this. Um, Rachel and I go way back. Um, and it's really been amazing to see your rise uh, at Micmac from afar. And just so cool to see where you've taken the business uh, from your original vision. So uh, congrats on another great year for you and, and the entire team. And really exciting to uh, regroup one year later from when we spoke a year ago um, about the very topic of holiday shopping and e-commerce and where the whole world is headed uh, amidst this crazy pandemic, which seems to create new news uh, for us every single day, not always the best news. Um, and you know, it's gonna be interesting once again to see how the consumer responds uh, to all these externalities, um, whether it be the macroeconomic factors, obviously the factors with the pandemic, um, you know, just to, to uh, general focus on consumers wanting to get out and buy stuff again in stores versus those who continue to want to buy some things um, on their phone or, or on their computers as it may. Um, for those of you who don't know, who Suzy is, we are a real-time market research platform. Uh, we work with hundreds of leading enterprises uh, to really empower consumer centricity within their organization. We have an always-on SaaS platform that allows companies to conduct market research in real time. Uh, we've been conducting these state of consumer webinars now uh, for about a year and a half. They've really been amazing for our community and we're gonna continue to invest in this channel uh, heading into 2022. I'd love to hear from you a little bit uh, about where Micmac has uh, come the last year and where you're thinking of taking the business uh, in the future, Rachel. Yeah, well, first of all, thank you for the congrats. I should pay it back to you. It's amazing to see Susie soar. Uh, so if you guys are not familiar with Micmac, we're also a SaaS platform and we work with big CPG brands and we follow the end-to-end -end customer journey across every major media channel, Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, TikTok, paid search, your brand website, all the way down to basket level sales data at places like Amazon, Target, Walmart. Uh, and so we've been doing this day in and day out for brands for the last seven years and Obviously, the world has changed over the last two, where e-commerce has become the heartbeat of any consumer product company's go-to-market strategy. Yep. And it's interesting because we kind of play in some businesses at, at both opposite ends of the funnel. You know, we are working with brands during the early innovation phase when they're trying to figure out what product they're going to bring to market and, you know, what they're going to charge for and how it's going to be packaged and what they're going to name it. And I know you guys focus across the funnel as well, but a lot of your focus is you know, starts at the purchasing cycle and, you know, how and when and where they purchase the product and how they repurchase it, et cetera. So in some ways we're looking at the market from two different sides. And that's why I really always enjoy talking to you um, because the people who you talk to with these large CPG companies have sort of a different lens and some of the ones that we speak to at those same companies, but ultimately, you know, insights have to meet commerce at some point. Um, all these big ideas have to meet the cash register. Well, and I would argue it's more important than ever before. I think for most brands today, their job has become supply chain. Yep. Uh, and what you're exactly talking about, how do we develop a product, physically bring it to market, make people aware, drive consideration, protect market share, et cetera. Yeah, it's interesting because logistics has been something that we all sort of swept under the rug for years. We just assumed the products would arrive from China. They would arrive on at the ports. They would come mm. to the warehouses. The consumers would be able to access them. There, it was sort of kind of the part of overall commerce that we took for granted. And now it's front and center. And now it's impacting, obviously, so many decisions that businesses make in terms of how much inventory they're going to order. You know, a good friend of mine runs a large apparel company. He was telling me that he had to make a bet back in March and April of this mm -hmm. year where the holiday was going to be and how do you yep. bet in this environment? Um, how do you not overswing and get too much inventory? And I think every business is really grappling with that decision. A hundred percent. Well, hopefully the bet worked out for your friend because man, was it a challenging, <laughs> challenging yeah. for, for a lot of people. Absolutely. And that's a good segue of what we're going to talk about. So um, 2020, we all know, saw a huge rise um, in both in, uh, in, in not as much in store, but definitely online shopping during holidays. It's actually a typo because in store uh, was not really a great channel for uh, companies um, in 2020. Um, you know, 
2020 was the year of e-commerce. We've all seen that fantastic slide from Bank of America that shows that overall e-commerce penetration over an eight-week period grew from 16% to 27%. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, obviously with consumers without a choice, but to buy online, they all went towards online as the channel to buy things they've always bought and, and new categories like groceries, which obviously, uh, you know, exploded uh, during 2020 with platforms like Instacart and Drizzly, et cetera. Um, the holidays are sort of the perfect storm in a good way for companies like Shopify and Amazon because you had all time record uh, savings. Uh, you know, the, the stimulus had just started to hit the checkbooks mm -hmm. uh, of most Americans and they weren't able to go in the stores. And we saw sort of like the mother of all quarters for companies like Amazon on Shopify in Q4 during 2020, which obviously, and you mentioned this yesterday when we were catching up, Rachel, has created some pretty challenging comps for these companies. Because how do you compete against sort of, uh, you know, a quarter where everything lines up perfectly? Yeah. And that's what sucks about Wall Street is this metric of how did you do this day last year, better or right. worse? And it's no true indication it's of business. 2020 when they're comparing it to 2019. So it doesn't exactly. matter. No, of course. Yeah. Of course, everyone had a great bonus last year, but this mm -hmm. year it's starting to normalize. Yeah, um, I think the, the big thing, you quoted Bank of America, one of my favorite reports that came out was last summer, BCG, and it focused on CPG. But what essentially it demonstrated is that once somewhere between 6 and 9% of total revenue comes from e -com, it becomes a channel that you can't ignore. Yep. You have to treat it like a core part of your P&L. And so... Last year, we saw anywhere between 25 and 33% of total revenue come from e-com. This year, is it all there? Commerce, all commerce. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But is it there this year? No. Is it back at like sub 3% where it was in 2019? Absolutely not. Is it hovering right. now around 20%? Yes. And that's still really substantial. Yeah. Well, it creates a new foundation to grow from. So obviously, mm -hmm. it was an artificial spike in some ways. And and we're all thankful that we're not still on complete lockdown <laughs> and there are other options for consumers, but obviously we talk about groceries. I mean, there were some consumers who would say, I'm never going to purchase groceries online. I need to touch and feel of the produce. And then once they saw how convenient it was to buy groceries from Instacart, many of them never went back. Auto is another category. A hundred percent. And we'll get more into this, but in a pre pandemic world, Instacart was Micmac's 19th most popular retailer. Today, it hovers between number four and five. Wow. So it just shows just the transformation of the industry. Oh, my. I, I had no idea that it was even that high. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we obviously are talking today about shopping and we're talking about how consumers purchase. And, you know, I'm really here to extract as much information out of Rachel as possible and make no stick about it, make, make the mistake about it. So while I usually kind of give my little spiel, this is going to be much more of an interactive uh, presentation and, um, you know, with myself and Rachel. But so first and foremost, 71 percent, according to Susie Research, of consumers had originally planned to shop during Black Friday um, and Cyber Monday. It's sort of a rite of passage is what consumers want to do. Um, it didn't necessarily always work out that way with consumers because deals started earlier than ever. If I recall correctly, in, in 2020, uh, Prime Day from Amazon was in July. What, when was it this year? So it, it moved to October. October. Gotcha. Yeah. So I would so imagine it that was in July. Yeah. Moved to October because of supply chain issues. But right. now it's created a new, it's crazy how the supply chain issues have just changed all consumer dynamics. Yep. It, it forced now every retailer to make competitive moves against Amazon. It started the holiday season now in October. And we'll get more into this, but there was an added dynamic this year of just the cost to bring goods to market, what inflation has done to really make brands and retailers rethink their promotional strategies. Absolutely. But it, since Prime Day was in October, I would imagine it sort of was the unofficial kickoff of the holiday shopping season because July was a little early for that. So did that sort of take away from some of the shine of Cyber Monday and Black Friday because it happened so close to those dates? Yeah, I mean, this year, I earlier, I would always say like, yes, because promotions are starting earlier, it started the holiday cycle earlier, but it has nothing to do about that this year. If you talk about just the toy industry, Parents were buying toys in August, right? Because the media scared people for the said, holiday for the holiday season. They just mm -hmm. wanted to make sure they had stuff. They just wanted to make sure that their kids would have presents 
come in time for the holiday season. Right. And so that's what really shaped 2021 was everyone making moves around the global supply chain crisis. Because it moved from a business story to a USA Today front page consumer story, inflation and supply chain. Um, mm -hmm. It was something that you would only see on CNBC or the Wall Street Journal a little earlier this year, maybe in January and February. And then it became in the center of the consumer lexicon. And because of that, it was front and center in driving their buying decisions. And that changed. That's right. Yeah. And, and it's crazy because those are words that most, again, most consumers ever thought about. They never worry about inflation. What many people don't know is in the eighties, you paid 18% um, interest when you bought a, a house on your mortgage. Mm -hmm. 18%. Mm -hmm. Now people complain about 3%. So yep. a lot of this is cyclical. Um, interest rates are so low right now. The cost of borrowing has never been uh, lower and the cost of capital um, has never been more accessible. And because of that, it's obviously driven this huge tech revolution, which you and I have both benefited from, from our mm -hmm. companies, Th things are, well, Mike, this might not last forever. And, you know, I think it, it's a good reminder when you talk about inflation and maybe it's a good thing that, um, you know, it's not, money is not as cheap because maybe things will become prohibitively expensive. We'll, we'll wait and see. Yeah. I mean, we also have to acknowledge what socioeconomic backgrounds we come from because, you know, there's a lot of injustice that exists in this world of the people of who are penalized by these things. Yep. Absolutely. In what ways do you think, Rachel? Um, I think folks who uh, are in a lower income bracket are experiencing the most amount of pain, right? Yeah. The pandemic really challenged them from an employment and right. you know, family care standpoint. And now they're they getting recovery that right. we talk about a lot. Yep. Right. Exactly. So, you know, the price right. of the kind of suit matters more to them than, you know, folks who potentially are operating in technology. Yep. And, and in terms of them getting into, you know, the housing market, for example, um, you know, for people who, who have not bought a home yet, you're mm -hmm. priced out now. And mm -hmm. as rental prices go up, that's another example on how people kind of can get boxed out. If, if you don't have enough discretionary expenditures to invest in the stock market and you only have enough to keep it in cash, and mm -hmm. inflation occurs, that's another way exactly. that you're going to get boxed out. So there are a lot of ways that, you know, it's not good for everyone for sure. I'm, you know, thank you for bringing that up. Um, so there's definitely a lot of complications this year, and you've mentioned some of them. We're going to be focusing on the complications and the factors that have made this year's holiday shopping season different than any other. Um, mm -hmm. And it really falls into four categories. First and foremost is just the availability of products, how hard mm -hmm. it has been to manufacture and ship um, and, and put products on the store shelves for consumers. Second mm -hmm. of all is inflation. And inflation has happened for a variety of reasons we'll get into, uh, not the least of which is, is the massive amounts of stimulus that have been pumped into the economy. Uh, when there's more money chasing fewer goods, that's when inflation happens. And we're starting to see that across a variety of categories. Uh, we're going to talk about the impact of media, whether it's a, a privacy changes of Apple or um, whether it's retailers demanding uh, more co-op spending support, um, which I learned about from you for the first time yesterday in terms of how big of a shift that is and we'll get into and then we'll talk about you know black friday cyber monday and what actually happened and, and what the implications were uh, uh you know from from now until the end of the year as well as heading into 2022 so just first a few point, light topics what's that <laughs> just a few light topics. Yeah, light topics and you know you and i will cover it no problem we got this uh so first and foremost product availability it's interesting when i look at this picture it actually reminds me of March and April 2022 when nothing was on the mm -hmm. store shelves, but it was for a completely different reason. It wasn't necessarily as much due to supply chain. It was just because everybody wanted to stock up and hoard toilet paper and paper towels. Um, mm -hmm. But now product availability is kind of taking a little bit of a different form and not necessarily the same types of products. Um, product availability is really more impacting products that are manufactured overseas. Uh, and that's obviously the heart of the you know supply chain issues. Um, you know, we're, we're seeing small businesses really starting to lose out more and more to Walmart and Amazon, mostly due to the pricing power. Mm -hmm. Companies uh, command, if you're a manufacturer and you have, um, you know, limited labor to produce something or you're a shipping company and you have limited room on your cargo ships to ship something over, who are you going to ship for? Your biggest customers, Walmart mm -hmm. and Amazon or, you know, a smaller company? Are you seeing a lot of independent retailers continue to get squeezed as a result of the supply chain issue? A hundred percent. Independent retailers, as well as the indie brands that are available at these large retailers. Right. So if you think about like all the darling direct to consumer brands that have crossed over into places like Walmart and Target, Whole Foods, et cetera, they're really being challenged right now because they often rely on a third party distributor versus someone like Mondelez who owns their own distribution. 
and the distributors, like they're having their own label labor crisis. And so it's just ex a domino effect across the entire ecosystem. So do you think this is going to create, I guess, reverberations in the 2022? We're going to see, you know, just more consolidation amongst the larger retailers and more pressure on the small businesses as we've already seen. Oh yeah. I mean, for the way that I'm thinking about this is I think we're living in a global supply chain crisis for the next five years. Right. I don't, I don't see how this immediately course corrects. And, you know, for really large brands, I think one of the conversations that they're having right now internally is what skews do we deprecate? Right. Because you can't have endless amount of inventory right now. And you really have to focus on these hero skews. So I think there's going to be in some ways deaths of certain product lines, which right. could it's in not the end selection in some ways, right? It's, yeah. it's right. Yeah. I mean, you walk into a supermarket and the, I know, I know food is not as much impacted, although it certainly is with rising commodity costs, but the amount of cereal brands you'll see when mm -hmm. you walk down the aisle, it's almost comical. Um, yeah. The amount of choice that Americans have, American consumers have in any category is mind boggling. And 100%. choice isn't always a good thing for consumers. Consumers, I think, want businesses to eliminate choice. They have enough to, to decisions to make. So in some ways, yeah. it, it is going to force a lot of these companies to make decisions. Yeah. And then on, for the small businesses, you know, we're going to talk a lot more about this, but I really, really feel for small businesses right now. First of all, you know, Matt and I are owners of fast growing companies, but we're, we're still small businesses. Right. And small businesses in, in CPG and consumer products, like it is tough. And yeah. It's more expensive than ever to bring a product to market. They can't get the distribution that they need. And, you know, they really probably got into the business because they thought they could build a D2C business. And that game is over for several reasons that, that we're about to get into. Um, but I say all this because the companies that are going to win over the next five years are ones that have scale within their DNA. The D C game is over, by the way. That just, I had to, I had to bring that up when you just mentioned it because mm -hmm. it's so... You're saying there's not going to be another Warby Parker anytime soon, another no. Albert anytime soon. No. And you just look at Casper and yep. every, look at Casper, look at Rent the Runwise IPO. Right. The, the venture capitalists kind of created this situation. They've been underwriting, right, all of our buying behaviors. Yep. And now that well has dried up because they're not getting the returns that they want. That's yep. number one. Number two, and we'll get more into this. You know, the D2C playbook that everyone has deployed for the last 10 years that have essentially been relying on buying Facebook ads, putting yeah. a Facebook pixel on your Shopify checkout cart, it's being rendered useless by the changes in iOS 14. And now number three is rising costs in fuel, packaging, labor crisis, inflation, all of these things that are making it impossible for you to profitably bring your product to market is now going to you're going to what you're going to see is all of these D2C businesses are going to be consolidating. And, and, and they, even, yeah, I mean it's fascinating Rachel because it even goes bigger than that, doesn't it? Because we had this incredible era of consumerism where mm -hmm. you could buy amazing products for so cheap that everybody had everything. I mean, the Toyota Camry of today would be looked at as a technological marvel 10 years ago, right? Mm -hmm. Or 15 years ago. Every product got so good. And mm -hmm. it's largely in part to cheap capital and, and VCs flooding the system. And, you know, it's not that way all around the world. And it certainly hasn't always been that way in America. Mm -hmm. And, you know, everything, again, bubbles out at some point. And it seems like what you're saying is, Maybe, you know, some of these options are going to go away. But one of the downsides I'm hearing is that it's just going to create more consolidation of power, especially as it relates to retail. Yeah, and a less competitive market. And so, listen, I'm not, I'm, I'm not a commercial business lawyer. I certainly have one on staff. Right. <laughs> but, uh, it's, it's a crazy time. It is. It is. Um, so let's talk about some categories and, you know, what we're seeing. So maybe I'm, I'm going to name these categories, Rachel, and I'd love to hear just off the top of your head what comes to mind in terms of the changes impacting these categories. So first let's talk about the grocery sector. Grocery is, is my meat and potatoes. Uh, no you pun know, intended. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, we work across all of the big CPG grocery brands, food, bev, alcohol, et cetera. And what I can tell you is that somewhere between 20 and 30% of my customers revenue is now coming from e-com and they're, many of these companies are projecting that it will soon become 50%. So that's massive. Is that the end of the supermarket? Uh, no, I think the supermarket is more relevant than ever before. 
The supermarket, however, is a true omni-channel customer experience. Right. And so uh, your ability to allow a consumer to seamlessly shop you across any media channel, mobile, tablet, desktop application, buy online, pick up in store, buy online, get to your deliver to your house in 15 minutes. And all of this is super, super important. Now, the, the big thing is the game of profitability. And so that's been the sort of the power dynamics and the friction between brand manufacturers, retailers, and then the intermediaries like the Instacarts of the world. Every slice of the way, it just becomes less profitable, yep. which is why now the grocers are really leaning on media, which we're about to get into, yep. to make their business more profitable. So like that's sort of my key headline from grocery. Right. And and it's interesting because when you talk about groceries and omni-channel, what comes to mind is obviously Walmart is huge in the grocery category mm -hmm. and, and Amazon bought Whole Foods to, to mm -hmm. basically accelerate it for the you know more affluent consumers. So they're both very heavily invested um, in that category. And then you have Instacart that, that we talked about. And right. And so, you know, everything on the slide here, this is Micmac first party data. So if you want to buy groceries online right now, the number one choice for customers and how to buy groceries in the U.S. is Instacart. So it yep. just shows you the power of that company. Which is, which is crazy because it's not a brand I would have thought most American consumers have heard of before. Mm -hmm. You know, certainly not a, as of a year ago. You know, mm -hmm. well, obviously they've had some very high profile. Um, you know, they, they just um, had uh, Karen Everson join there from from Facebook. So they're starting to get, you know, a lot of big talent there. And they're, they're heading to the center of consumer psyche, but not as much as... Um, you know, I think those numbers indicate. Um, let's talk about the beauty uh, category. So it looks like Ulta is the number one um, platform for, for the beauty category. Yeah, I mean, Ulta has made such huge strides. You know, it's, it's really, they've done two things really well, value and just breadth of inventory. Um, and so we continue to be really excited about Ulta as a category. They're also starting to heavily deploy their marketplace strategy. So for example, if you were to walk into a Kohl's, you can also buy Ulta products. Yeah. And, and so, you know, we're very, very excited about sort of the cross sharing of product catalogs. Yeah. So let's talk about Target. Last year, you were telling me how amazing Target did. And as soon as the call or our webinar is over, I went and bought a bunch of their stock. Uh, <laughs> I took your word for it. And, and uh, so drinks on me next time. But yeah. uh, um, so are they still sort of on fire as it relates to the consumer? And how has their business evolved over the past year? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's really interesting. Our top three retailers in the U.S. are always hovering around Amazon, Target, Walmart. But last year, Walmart beat Target. And this year, Target beat Walmart. And what I mean by that is consumers were choosing Target over Walmart. And so, you know, what Target continues to do really, really well is invest in their own D2C brands. Yep. So what we, what we used to call private label is now just, you know, Target's good and gather line. And consumers see these as household names now. And yeah. so they continue to double down on that as their strength. I would have to think also in a down market, it favors Walmart because they're about everyday low prices and they're really a value based positioning where Target, even though the prices aren't that different, you know, has the perception of being a little bit more upscale than Walmart. And when consumers mm -hmm. have record savings, maybe they'll say, oh, I'll splurge and go to Target yeah. versus Walmart. Yes, but if you want another prediction, if I was a betting woman and I had to spend a dollar on Walmart or Target stock, I would put it on Walmart. Uh, I am very, very impressed by the moves that they're making within media, which again, yep. we'll get into, and how they're becoming way more open with their data. And I think people who take these types of approaches are going to end up being the Trojan horses. How about Costco, who's done incredibly well this year? Yeah. From a number standpoint. Yeah, you know, Costco, Sam's Club, um, from like a value play, it's absolutely there. They're starting to invest more in their media businesses. Right. They obviously have like, it's based on credit card and the membership program. So they have a lot of first party data at their disposal. They've lagged in e-commerce, haven't they? Yeah, yeah that's yeah. changing. Yeah. And though so I would say like, in terms of their aggressive moves in media, I wouldn't say that the value players have been making any of the big aggressive moves in terms of really taking their data and bringing it more to the open web. And right. that's not to say that they won't do it. We just really it's haven't seen that. Costco has always had a membership program. So they have the ultimate 
first mm-hmm. party treasure trove of data. Mm-hmm. So if anyone could have done it, it would have been Costco. Um, yeah, and, and yeah. maybe it's up their sleeve. We just haven't right. seen it yet. Right. Absolutely. Um, we asked consumers, you know, what, what do they do if items are out of stock? Mm-hmm. And about a third say they choose another item. Um, and 37% said they wait for the item to become available. And I guess it all depends upon what the brand is. One thing we definitely saw at the beginning of the pandemic is many new brands got a shot with the consumer because they need it toilet paper. They needed paper towels. They needed soap. And if the, the, the brand they usually bought wasn't there, they try a new brand. And that gave these new brands the ability to create brand loyalty. Obviously, we're living in a completely um, different world now. Let's talk about in-store. Uh, because, you know, the, the headlines now are is that, you know, more consumers have gone in store this year. Again, it is all about comps. And last mm-hmm. year, consumers couldn't or mm-hmm. they'd be very unlikely to go into a store last year versus this year. How are consumers looking at the, you know, in the scheme of the grand reopening about going back into stores and, and which retailers are they more likely to be headed into? Yeah. I mean, Micmac's business is really primarily focused on e-com. So yep. uh I can tell you what, what we see because we do support like buy online, pick up in store. Right. The the in-store behavior is really about is about convenience and local inventory. And it reminds me of something that we actually experienced early in the pandemic, which is when you saw Amazon lose market share. So I'll give you an example in the pet category, you know, one of our customers is Petco. And in the first part of the pandemic, like they were able to start taking away market share from Amazon because Amazon didn't have the goods and Petco is readily available in your local town. And so being able to capitalize on that was super powerful. Another retailer who was able to capitalize on that compared to Amazon was Dick's Sporting Goods. And so, yeah. yeah. And so your ability to communicate to the end customer, like we have local inventory available right now, it actually can get fast, get there faster to you than Amazon is become a position of strength for people who have physical brick and mortar uh, presence. Yeah. One thing that I think was slightly overblown and maybe we'll see it in the future is just that, you know, stores have the ability to create an experience and things of that nature. I just don't think that the world has recovered to the experience economy yet. And people are going to go into a retailer for an experience. I think that was a 2019 story. Uh, yeah. Maybe it'll come back. Uh, but with one variant after the next, I don't think consumers are going to want to go into a store for an experience right now. Um, so I think we can kind of shut that down until, you know, we knock this COVID thing out for good. Uh, who knows when that will be? Hopefully soon. <laughs> Um, so we talked about e-commerce rise. So you were telling me earlier, telling us earlier, Rachel, that like there was a spike last year and then it kind of came down, but what are we looking at here then? Cause it looks like the e-commerce revenue has continued to go up yeah. over time. It continues to grow up. It's just at a slightly different growth rate and it's uh-huh. not the growth rate of 2020. Got it. Got it. So I think that's like, those are the conversations. You're ta- when you were mentioning, you were talking about growth rates. You were, growth were rates. About, right? Yeah. 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 And so, you know, this is part of the tempered expectation that you need to be able to set with your your CFO, which is like, listen, 2020 was the freaking e-com gold rush. Yes, penetration will continue, but it's not going to happen at the exact growth rate of 2020. And so you need to be more realistic with how you're modeling out that growth. Absolutely. There's some categories like, you know, auto. Uh, which I know you don't do a ton of work in, but it's just been fascinating to me to see consumers suddenly get comfortable with platforms like Carvana and now Mm -hmm. Nissan launched Nissan at home where, you know, basically the the automotive manufacturers are saying, listen, these, this dealer model is dated. Mm -hmm. Consumers hate going into car dealerships. They don't want, you know, they don't want to go to some far off location to go to this huge lot. They, they know what they want. And, you know, Tesla kind of jumped into that first. Um, And I think that's another category that we're going to see a, you know, continue growth in and just a lot more disruption and moving forward in e-commerce is the auto space. Any other yeah. spaces that come to mind? Any thoughts on auto as well? No, I mean, auto is a great example. It's one of Amazon's fastest growing categories, just in the like auto parts and then the yeah. used parts. Um, so no, we're really bullish on that as a category. I would say, you know, other categories that we're really bullish on uh, is anything to do around like home appliances, continued investments there, gardening, pet like we, we're just continuing to double down within those environments yeah and you know the housing market has not cooled mm-hmm. um, it maybe it will um when interest rates rise maybe it will when you know more inventory comes onto the market but in most major cities you know the housing prices are still all-time highs and as long as that's the case people are going to spend more in their homes they're not going yeah. to the office right i mean that's and the, the other category worth mentioning because everyone felt like oh it's going to normalize when the world changes 
is alcohol. We do so much work with online alcohol shopping yeah. and Drizzly. So Instacart and Drizzly. Uber constantly, purchase Drizzly, correct? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Constantly switch at Micmac between our fourth and fifth most popular retailer in the U.S., which Makes just sense. shows you like people are still buying booze online. Yeah. What better way to get through the pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. um, inflation. So inflation is obviously a real issue. Um, it hits the consumers. It hits, as you mentioned earlier, the margin of, of businesses. It's a, it's a global macroeconomic issue that's driven by a variety of different factors, and many of which are largely unpredictable. Um, I saw a fascinating piece on 60 Minutes a couple of weeks ago uh, where the reporter was kind of walking through every single step of the supply chain. Mm -hmm. And as he spoke to every, you know, whether it's the person at the shipping port or the person at the warehouse or the person at retail, they were all blaming each other. They all had their fingers in different directions. And it just seems like it's a glut and it's a mess and there's not the right technology in place. You know, I, I was asked by my son who is in ninth grade, he's like, well, why can't they just make iPhones in the U S and I said, well, then they'd be $10,000 right. uh, purchase. So, you know, but ultimately it goes back to what we were saying earlier is that things might become more expensive because businesses are going to start making things in the U S more and people don't work for the same price as they do in the U S mm -hmm. um, there's so much entitlement here. You know, we mm -hmm. are Intel announced that they're going to start producing chips um, in Arizona. Mm -hmm. the, it's going to become more expensive again for these things. Mm -hmm. Not everyone's going to have the new iPhone every single cycle or a new laptop. We used to keep laptops for a lot longer and it was for a reason. It talks about mm -hmm. the reality of the economy. So, yep. um, so, you know, obviously it, it, consumers don't really know how to handle this because talk about millennials who are now the head of the household. They haven't lived through an inflationary cycle. They haven't, they weren't buying stuff in 1980 when they were, you know, 15 or 12 years old. They didn't have to worry about that stuff last time, um, you know, as the, in the post Carter uh, era when we had all this inflation. So it's something that a lot of consumers are grappling with and it is going to be, and I agree with you, this is not a transitory factor. This is here to stay, it's going to be a shock to the system because we had entered this world where prices were so um, low and products were so accessible. Even travel was so accessible. I mm -hmm. mean, be nobody went to Europe before they were 30 years old. And then all of a sudden you jump on kayak and you can go to round trip to London for $300 yep. from New York because oil prices were low. I mean, mm -hmm. inflation impacts everything. And a mm -hmm. lot of things are going to be much more uh, cost prohibitive uh, moving forward. Um, so let's talk about... Uh, uh, Black Friday and, and what we saw Black Friday. What was your main takeaway from Black Friday? Our biggest thing that we saw at Micmac was Black Friday wasn't as splashy as it normally is, uh, uh -huh. but, not, but, but not by much. Like we saw less than like 1% sort of decrease in conversion rate, but at scale, that's pretty significant. Uh, and it's really because of people shopping earlier. And I'm I don't think it's shopping earlier because the promotion started earlier. I actually feel there were fewer promotions because of everything that we just identified, yeah. supply chain, inflation, labor costs, et cetera. Um, and that was really what dictated the holiday season. Yep. Yep. Totally makes sense and in line with what we've read and heard as well. So, and, and, you know, a big thing again, that, that we, you've talked about a lot is just the impact of media, um, you know, on the commerce business in general, because yeah. if you think about how people, why and how people buy stuff is because they've heard of it. It's promoted mm -hmm. in some way, shape or form. Um, we all know that consumers are not watching linear television the way they used to. We all know that first party data um, is more important than ever before. The notion that big companies like Coca-Cola in the past did not have to know who their buyer was by name, because as long as they kept getting pallets shipped to Walmart mm -hmm. and Target, grocery stores and they had good shelf placement, they would move units and it would be all good. Mm -hmm. That might not be the case uh, when people, you know, adopt platforms like Drizzly and, Inst and Instacart and Amazon, et cetera. So the world is shifting in a massive mm -hmm. way. It's going to create a lot of losers and, and some winners that come out of it. Um, and one thing that you spoke about yesterday, Rachel, was just this huge media opportunity for retailers and how mm -hmm. they're leveraging their last mile impact to almost like, extract a tax in some ways for their um, merchants. I don't know if that's the best way to put it. Their, their uh, manufacturers, rather. Talk to, talk to us about that. Yeah. So if we were to boil down 2021 versus 2022, we talked about the macroeconomic factors, but now we're talking about the changes in the industry. And these are the two things that are going to continue to shape commerce, I believe, for the next five years. Yeah. So the headline is the changing ecosystem of media. 
if you were a consumer products company historically, the lion's share of your media investment would have gone to brand investments because you sure. wanted people to be aware that you existed, right? And you would invest in upper funnel channels like TV, Facebook, uh, programmatic media. And then trade media would be relegated to the sales team and would honestly be completely like divorced from the CMO's purview. They would right. not be thinking about that. Yep. And I remember like for those of you old school people uh, watching right now, it's almost like the old Sunday circulars, right? Mm -hmm. where, where, you know, a retail or department store would run a Sunday circular and you'd see ads from all the manufacturers in there. That was the original sort of co-op advertising spend. Yes, 100%. Yep. And so fast forward, what's happened is all of a sudden Amazon rises, right? And they start to build a really profitable ad business. And then all of a sudden, the retailers are like, wait a second, we can start to build profitability into the business plan. And this is happening against the backdrop of the rise of e-commerce, which is honestly not profitable for most consumer product companies. If you just think about what you're buying the product at and all the hands that it touches to yeah. inevitably get to their warehouse and then get to you, then the change in the customer journey, then all of these macroeconomic factors, and then fast forward, you're a brand manufacturer, you're having a conversation with a retailer and you're like, listen, I can no longer sell my soup at the lowest price. Right. I need to raise prices. And then the retailer is like, no, 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 you cannot do that. The consumer is going to be up in arms. And the retailer goes, well, if you're going to try to do that, we got to offset it in some other way. And the way that you're going to offset it is with media. So that's like headline number one. Meaning like we're going to have less conversion because you're charging more. So we need yes. to spend more on reaching people. Yes. And now right. that's, that's headline number one. Headline number two is totally different, but it's the perfect storm, which is the war over first party data, which is Apple all of a sudden realizing, wait a second, we haven't been fully monetizing the entire ecosystem the way that we can be. We actually control way more of the internet than these other platforms. The rails, they control the, the product that's in people's exactly. hands. Right. So like, let's make some changes to iOS 14 that's going to make it much more difficult for all of our uh, incumbents to do business. That was number one. The number two, Google's like, wait a second, fuck you. Now I need to make a change. And then Facebook is like, holy shit, we weren't prepared for this. And then you just start to see all of this have a domino effect and obviously their earnings. And so I bring all of this up because who has the most amount of first party data outside of someone like Apple or Google? It's the retailers. Yep. And the retailers all of a sudden go, wait a second, we can actually take away ad dollars from Facebook because what we can tell an advertiser is guaranteed ROI as well as brand safety. Yep. Now, the most challenging part of retail media has been that there's not enough supply. So then the retail like inventory, media inventory. Yep. Right. And so then smart retailers like Amazon and Walmart go, okay, well, how do we create more supply? Let's be a little bit more open with our data. And let's start letting people buy Roku ads against Amazon audiences. Or let's start letting people buy media through the trade desk against Walmart audiences. So if you're selling, I'm, I'm going to try to not dumb it down because we have a very smart audience, but I'm going to try to, um, you know, try to simplify it. If you are selling laundry detergent and you want to sell more laundry detergent on Target, you can pay Target to be able to run ads on New York Times or anywhere around the web targeting people who you know are target shoppers uh, of that category to basically drive them to purchase your stuff. Yeah, and so that's been the big change in the ecosystem is that before you would only be able to buy within Target's owned and operated right. channels. Now right. they're becoming way more open. And so I say all of this because it is putting so much pressure on advertisers to one, move brand dollars to the retail media groups at but the then, expense of Facebook and some of the right. other, right? And then, Let alone traditional TV. Right. Now it's threatening right. the rest of the publisher ecosystem. Right. And so this is where things get really interesting. Um, and it's just, it's crazy times in this industry. It's shifted all the way down, Rachel, because like, you know, I often talk about the TV industrial complex in the 50s, 60s, 70s, where people are spending money at top of the funnel. There were three or four networks. If you had a checkbook, you'd advertise on the Ed Sullivan show and you'd mm -hmm. get the eyeballs and they, mm -hmm. and they would actually drive. Then with social media era, it was about performance marketing and, and you were doing, you know, first pay per lead and you were paying now. You're, so that's kind of in the middle. And now you're paying for the end of the funnel. You're actually paying the retailer to promote it. 
So it's yeah. moving all the way down to the last rail. Um, the question that came, comes to my mind is, well, then what about brand? Like, what's going to happen to brands? Right. But that this is where things like OTT and commerce, for me, that's what I'm most excited about. I think next year when we talk about 2022, like, we're going to have a really rich conversation around that. We're powering a lot of the commerce right now in environments like Roku. And it's the psychological impact of television with the targeting of direct response advertising. Right. Right. They're going to have and to so, go there. Yeah. And so the, it's just going to be a shift. Yeah. And I, I think it's an exciting one. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm jumping around only because we, we only have so much time. And yep. I want to make sure we cover some of the other big points. Let's talk about TikTok. Because, you, you know, you're talking about Roku. And TikTok obviously has been a revelation in social media. The algorithm is like none other, despite some of the issues they've had based upon their parent company being China. Um, and, you know, President Trump, former President Trump saying that, you know, they were going to have to be sold off to another company. Uh, Oracle was going to buy them. That never happened. So, but TikTok has obviously had an amazing year in 2021. And yeah. I think what a lot of people probably don't know is how um, impactful they are in the e-commerce space. Yeah. So, I mean, like last year, TikTok was an experiment um, for most of our customers. And now we're seeing TikTok's conversion rates be as strong as Pinterest. Um, yeah. And if you just think about how high of an intent it is when you're in an environment like Pinterest to buy something, it's really, really powerful. And this is against the backdrop of the changes in iOS 14. And, you know, the difference between someone like Facebook and someone like TikTok is Facebook built a DR ad product around a cookie. Yep. Essentially the Facebook pixel. Yep. TikTok built a platform around a algorithm that personalizes your feed to your exact desires. Right. Like a graphic profile, and, behavioral right. profile. Yeah. And it, it's allowed them um, to not be challenged by things like iOS 14. Right. And so, you know, obviously Zuckerberg talked about this in his quarterly earnings. Like Facebook will course correct. You know, they're investing a lot of resources to try to navigate this. But for the time being, it's a really, really challenging place to be putting your DR ad dollars. Yeah, and I would argue it's going to be hard for them to course correct in the extent that, you know, a lot of their platforms and brands are not as popular as they used to be. Um, the Facebook platform itself has continued to, you know, reduce in its growth every single year. While Instagram still remains incredibly popular, you have TikTok growing, you have Snapchat growing. It's only a matter of time before another platform emerges. So, you know, we've went through, we talked about cycles. There was a time when no one could ever imagine Yahoo and MSN or AOL not ruling the internet. Um, yep. So maybe Facebook won't be They'll certainly be around, but they might be a, sh a shell of who they were 10 years from now, or maybe not. It remains to be seen. One thing's for certain is that Facebook has not innovated, um, you know, nearly as fast. They've, they've built a lot of copycat products. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's hurt them. Um, yeah. And I think now, you know, they're obviously trying to reinvent as meta, but, mm -hmm. you know, they've been a duopoly with Google in terms of a force of media. Google's continued to just kill it. I mean, mm -hmm. the Google search business model is just such an incredible business model, but YouTube has continued to grow and, you know, they, you know, and they also have the Android platform to lean into. So, mm -hmm. you know, there's just a lot there that they have that Facebook doesn't, that makes me a lot more bullish about them moving forward. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, you look at their quarterly earnings and search is what really made them resilient during this time. Yep. Yep. It's interesting though, because, you know, you talk about the last mile, and I worked very closely with Microsoft when they were launching Windows Phone. Um, mm. And, you know, I really thought it should be called Xbox Phone because that was the brand that was so much more powerful than, mm. than Windows Phone. Mm. But, you know, you know that, that phone did not work out as they had uh, thought it would. Amazon had their Fire device, their phone mm. that didn't work. Um, mm. So Facebook tried to launch their own phone. That yeah. didn't work. The reason all these companies tried to create their own phones is because they saw what was happening, that they didn't have the last mile. And now look what, what, what Apple is able to do because they do. They're able to control the ecosystem as will retailers. And mm -hmm. that sounds like we're starting to see. So um, it's fascinating to see how quickly things change too, because a couple of years ago, we never would have thought we'd be having um, this discussion. So yeah. from your research, it shows that social drives a ton of e-commerce traffic overall. So is social growing as, and you were right, social and programmatic, but isn't, aren't they one and the same? What's the distinction there? Uh, I mean, social for us are like the native platforms and programmatic would be something like the trade desk or Verizon. Yeah, media. Some more display and things yeah. like that. Right. I think the big headline here is that, you know, and we do a ton of work in CPG and that's, you know, our data is really rooted in, but 75% of awareness-based media now is being tagged with commerce. 
And I think that's the really important aha moment is that, you know, right now for the consumer, it's about knowing where is this product available for me to buy right now. It isn't that you have to convince me to buy. Versus like complete. brand ads in the past, just do it or whatever, where right. it was so disconnected from commerce. Mm -hmm. Now content and commerce are really connecting. Exactly. And you can have the conversion rates because of, it's about needs now and not wants. You can have conversion rates in upper funnel media that's very analogous to the conversion rates that you would have seen in lower funnel media. Right. So in that way, it's quite cost effective. And I would imagine I also will continue to give influencers more yeah. power if they're if they are controlling the eyeballs mm -hmm. in social media. Um, and you know, can they connect their brands like to commerce, like something Navy, who's a fashion blogger, mm -hmm. has a great career of connecting her brand, um, you know, her her influencer brand to a fashion brand. And really yep. connecting the two, um, you know, we'll probably start to see more, more and more of that moving forward. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, you know, you mentioned a lot about omni-channel and how omni-channel has changed. And, and in the past, it's it's mainly looked at where the shopper was engaging and how. But today, it's it's become much more robust in terms of the information that you're able to uncover about consumers. Can you talk a little bit about omni-channel and how retailers are able to execute that? Yeah, so... You know, if you think about the last 10 years, it's all been about understanding that customer journey. And then fast forward, all of a sudden we started to read the tea leaves of what are these platforms trying to do? And what they're trying to do is own the most amount of first party data on the internet. So then they can monetize answering this question of who is your customer? Yep. And in the backdrop of all of these privacy changes, it's going to be more difficult than ever before for a brand manufacturer to answer this question of who is my customer? Yeah. And this, and I know Susie spends a lot of time thinking about this, this is happening against demographically how we're changing in terms of how we identify like Gen Alpha, more non-white babies being born than white babies. Gen Z, a third of them not identifying as heterosexual, right? Millennials, most of them see themselves as an atheist. And I say all mm -hmm. of this because a big part of the future customer journey is brands having the ability to answer who is my customer. And that's where, you know, we brought to market a product this year called Shopper Intelligence in partnership with LiveRamp. But just thinking about your strategy and the identity solutions that you're going to need to be able to have to navigate this new ecosystem is something that I believe in 2022, you and I are going to spend a lot of time talking about. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. And, you know, I think your, your example of TikTok is a great one where they, they built their mm -hmm. algorithm on the who. Not just you know what consumers have done based upon their pixel and you 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 tag them, but they understand really who their consumer is. They create these consumer profiles and segmentation um, through algorithms that make it so it's like how did TikTok know I like this? And that's what brands are going to have to do for their own. It sounds like their media and how they partner with retailers, et cetera, moving forward. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to go very quickly just to some other um, very. Um, kind of high level headlines and we're going to um, turn it over for some questions. Um, buy now, pay later has been um, huge. You, you know, you mm -hmm. see companies like Klarna and Affirm that allow consumers and, 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 you know, Affirm really became big with Peloton where here you have a $2,500 purchase. Mm -hmm. Most consumers don't have the ability to shell that out, but Hey, you're paying $30 a month or 40 bucks a month. Sure. I can swing that. I'll get a Peloton. And now you're really starting to see it enter almost every single e-commerce transaction. Um, you know, even on Cameo, if you if you want to get a celebrity to give a friend a birthday shout out, you can actually spread that payment out. So yep. it really has entered everywhere. A firm announced a huge partnership uh, with Amazon, um, where now you can basically buy now, pay later um, on Amazon using their platform. Is this something that you uh, seeing continue? And I would imagine if interest rates spike, then maybe these offers won't be able to be as appealing anymore because now all of a sudden you have to pay interest on you know, the loan that you're essentially getting. But right now it's basically next to nothing. Yeah. I mean, that's my, I'm scared about this. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's going to feel very bubbly. It feels very yeah. bubbly to me. It's super it's, bubbly. It's subprime credit all over again. Yeah. And right. again, I, I think the people who get taken advantage of are, are the less fortunate in of these course. situations. And it's so, the housing crisis. Same yeah, thing. exactly. This is the new Freddie Mac. But um, right. yeah, it scares me. I do think this will continue to be adopted. And I think it's going to pop. And I think a lot of people are going to be in financial disarray. And businesses as well, because they're going to be left holding the bag. I mean, I don't know what the, the debt structure is with these companies. Mm -hmm. but, you know, does a firm pay the, you know, Peloton the money? And then are they carrying the debt on their balance sheet? Or mm -hmm. are they 
service element. I'm not so sure about that, but there are going to be businesses that a aren't going to be able to sell as much stuff anymore because consumers are going to have to pay 18% interest on their, uh, you know, MasterCard versus mm -hmm. 1% interest on a, you know, in a firm. So there's just a lot of things that will come out of this. And this is again, one, I, I would say artificial accelerant that's driving this rising consumerism, especially yep. with some of the more higher ticket items like yep. Pelotons and things uh, of that nature. Um, so let's, let's, um, just wrap up with the presentation. I would just love to know from you, Rachel, like what are some of the big predictions that you have? And you're welcome to just sort of um, reaffirm some of the things that you talked about during this presentation that will really make the headlines in 2022 as it relates to retailers and brands at e-commerce and the consumer. Yeah. I think this time next year, you and I are going to be reflecting on how supply chain really forced people to think about their merchandising strategy differently. I think we're going to be talking about the death of D2C, mm -hmm. which is sad for a lot of small businesses. D2C, you're saying D2C startups. Yep. And but, you know, a lot of the big CPGs still want to create their own direct-to-consumer channel. Yeah, I would, say the, I would say the big difference is most of them have recognized that it will be, if at max, 10% of their total revenue. Right. Now, this is right. totally category dependent. So yeah. I don't know who's going to consumer data. It plays right. a role exactly. in the overall business. Exactly. Now. Right. Um, I think we're going to continue to be talking about how retail media is stealing market share from traditional media channels. I think we're going to talk about OTT and commerce, uh, which I'm very excited about. Yeah. And I think we're going to talk about the financial health of this country and what it means for consumers by the end Absolutely. of next year. Yeah. I think that we're going to be definitely heading towards an economic um, turn down <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. next year. I think that interest rates will continue to rise. I think um, inflation will take hold. I think that the, you know, the glow, the stimulus will start to wear off. Um, and I think we're going to start to see us go through a cycle that's not going to be so pretty for a while because we, in some ways, pushed off the pain that the country needed to go through as a result of the pandemic. We sort of gave it an artificial steroid to get through it. And once it wears off, you really you feel the pain yeah. even more. And I think that's what's going to start to happen. And reflecting on our conversation, because it all ties together, I also think next year you and I will be talking about the secondhand market. Yeah. Um, I think about that all the time. Like, mm -hmm. why can't people just get things on eBay? Like, mm -hmm. you talk about supply chain. If you want to buy something, if you're worried about buying that toy, I mm -hmm. guarantee you, you could have gotten it on eBay. and It could have even been boxed. Mm -hmm. uh, on eBay. There's just so much stuff that's on land in the United States that mm -hmm. people have in warehouses, et cetera. And I, I'm a big fan of that. And I think platforms like that, secondhand or just direct, mm -hmm. you know, peer to peer mm -hmm. commerce mm -hmm. as well. I think it's a great point. Cool. With the time we have left, Abel, are you there in the cyber web somewhere? There you go. Uh, good to see you, Abel. Um, my trusty colleague who's going to go over some questions um, that we got during the presentation. Yep. Question here. And rethinking yep. overall door uh, buster or discount strategy going forward. Um, you know, have research, uh, have margins are now starting to matter a little bit more. Um, Rachel, why don't we take you with this question? You cut out a little bit there. Yeah, you right? cut out. So I think I missed the most important part. Yeah. Uh, so we're just seeing do we still think that discount strategy is going to be as important going forward? Discounting strategies overall. Yeah. So if everything Matt and I just said plays out where, you know, consumers might be in financial distress, then discounting is going to matter a lot. Now, that's going to be against questioning how what improvements did we make to supply chain? What have, improvements have we done for the cost of fuel, labor costs? Like all of that comes into play when someone's thinking about their discounting strategy. But from a consumer standpoint, like, if inflation is really creating a lot of pain for them, um, then discounts are going to need to be had. Right. Definitely. Um, all right. Next question here, Rachel. I know you talked a little bit about some of the data that you guys have um, Monday, but um, do you have any data about the weeks before Black Friday? Maybe some of the the you know final weeks of October, early November that you could talk a little bit about. Yeah. So um, we saw a sort of e-com traffic in November really peak around the first two weeks. So most people were getting ahead of the holiday season. And it's interesting, like we see that trend hold for other holidays. So if you're talking about Valentine's Day or Memorial Day weekend or Cinco de Mayo, 
like in terms of people planning and how they think about their buying cycles, it always seems to be like two weeks leading into an event. Did I start seeing Black Friday like at the end of October? Yeah. Hey, Abel, just so you know, you, you, you're you you're breaking in and out. So we're only seeing right now you're frozen on a really elated uh, screenshot, <laughs> I wish I'd say there. So um, oh, yeah. let me try again. Otherwise, I'll try to get to the questions. Okay, I can read cool. them Oh, all right. So we lost uh, Abel. So I'll try to take his job with the couple minutes we have left. Um, so this is a question from Jessica. She wrote, the brand versus retailer media allocation is messy and complicated. Uh, brands will, uh, you know, win on the dot-com sites when consumers search by their brand name versus generic terms. So there's still a critical need for brand air coverage. How are brands balancing that need? And I agree. I mean, that was when I was talking about, like, what about the brand and all this? What are your thoughts yeah. on that? No, I... I believe in the power of brand. Uh, yeah. You know, before I built Micmac, I ran Digital at Gap, and when we invested in TV, mobile, and social all at once, we saw a three x lift in our CPA efficiency. Yeah, because we didn't have to work as hard. And yep. so, the power of brand is so important, and it goes back to what we're saying: like scale is going to win the day. Yeah. So you you can't just go all in. I would never advise that in one form. But my big thing is the retail media groups are moving more upper funnel. Yeah. And so you're going to have these brand plays where you can just be giving more dollars to Walmart Connect. And right. that's where you're going to start to see this seismic shift in the industry. Yeah, it's a great point. Um, the question from Marco, he wrote, with the increased importance of zero party data, how do you, uh, you see retailers and brands shifting their marketing efforts? So first and foremost, I'd love to know what zero party data is. And second of all, how are brands actually collect, trying to collect their own data? But what is zero party data? Zero party data is like you fully own, like everything that's right. going on, Susie. Right. 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 Susie.com, like you're fully owning that. Yeah. Um, how do you see retailers and brands shift their sales? Yeah, how are they going to collect their own data? Like it's, it sounds like if the retailers have the par power because they have first party mm -hmm. data, then how can P&G collect its own first party data? Are they trying to? It's increasingly more difficult. What I always say to people is you need to answer this question. What does your brand have permission to do that Mr. Jeff Bezos does not? So right. in, the, in the case of like Glossier, right, the, the epitome of the darling direct consumer brand and beauty, Emily Weiss has 5,000 millennial women that you can text for beauty advice. You're never going to text Jeff Bezos for beauty advice. Right. And so I do think you need to ask yourself, like, what is that value proposition? That yeah, where do you have a right to win? Where right. do you have a right exactly. to win? And that's where you're going to collect the data. Yeah, because what we've seen during the pandemic is consumers trust brands more mm -hmm. than media, more than the government in some instances. So if you have, if you are in the position of having a trusted brand, you can leverage that. Yeah. Content really is what it's all about. Listen, I have customers, they you know have an electric toothbrush and the electric toothbrush is not where the lion's share of their money comes from. They use the electric toothbrush because they have all of this data on when and how consumers brush their teeth. And right. that allows them to bring new products to market, to innovate, to think about the buying cycle, and so it's, you know, thinking about the data that you have available and how you're going to use it. Yep. Awesome. This has been, this is officially my favorite webinar every single year. <laughs> Must be a tradition. Um, yes. So I want to thank you. I know you're very busy. Thank you so much for your time. I know that everyone who tuned in got a ton of value, as did I. And wishing you and the whole team at Micmac an amazing holiday season. Nothing but continued success into 2022. Really, as always, appreciate you taking the time to join, Rachel. Well, the sentiment is totally mutual. Uh, and thanks, guys, for tuning in. Yeah, thanks, everyone. We'll see you soon. Until next time. Take care. Bye-bye.